Hello, early birds. Good evening, everyone. How are you all doing? Well, I guess one good thing about this five minutes early start is that it gives me the opportunity to kind of get used to the idea of speaking without feedback. It's not easy, you know. I trained as a lawyer, yeah, but this one is a whole new gig. It takes getting used to as well. Okay, so we'll wait and then kick off at seven o'clock. All right. Okay, so some little bird just told me it's all good, so you can hear me good. And I guess the picture quality, everything. Maybe even me, I'm pretending to even be looking fine too. Let me say, even pretend like I'm a fine boy. All right, but um, on a more serious note, today we'll um, we'll be taking the second part. Wait, oh, yeah, the second part of what I promised is going to be a four-part series. It's at least for the benefit of those of us who are here, let me just try and explain this again. I've realized that it's easier if we broke this down into bite sizes. And then I reckon that that will make it that much easier for everyone to follow. And um, those who have objections or arguments for or against some of the many things I'm going to be saying during the course of the series. I'm hoping that you can have your feedback. We can argue these things out. you probably convince me or I might be able to convince you. But let it always be by way of superior argument and logic. So if we are able to convince ourselves, then we can speak with one voice in the clear understanding that we're fighting to a common purpose. So please feel free all you want to disagree as much as you believe necessary. If I have said anything or if I will say anything in the course of the week that you find reason to disagree with, because I'm going to be saying a lot of things that a lot of people will necessarily disagree with. And that's also fine. It is in the course of these arguments that we refine our thoughts and that's how human civilization has always grown, superior argument. So we argue these things out. So, okay, we go one more minute. Okay. I hope you have, you've been served dinner. Somebody was raising the question of if I was going to serve food. And like, see, you're at home already or you're in traffic. But like if you're in Lagos, you're in traffic. If you're in, in Abuja and you live in those satellite towns as well, you're in traffic reality of Nigerian life, spend the bulk of our lives in traffic, but you can serve yourself something. Shouldn't be eating too late in the day, seven o'clock now. So good evening, everyone. We have some preamble where I was busy queuing my, you know, here they say testing, testing, mic and all of that. So here is what I want us to do tonight. We've talked a lot about, in the last lecture, the first, the opening one, what I sought to do was to give us sort of like an historical overview, a background for how we got to where we currently are. Um, now we are where we are. I believe that it's time to start talking about where we need to be and how to get to that place where we need to be. Hmm. It is my honest opinion that um, the, the commonality of the Nigerian affliction, whether you are a Yoruba man as I am, or you are an Igbo man, or an Ibiobio, or an Ausa, or a Fulani, or an Anga, wherever you be from in Nigeria, whether you're rich or you're poor, the reality is that Unless you are a member of the ruling class and you are cocooned from the reality of Nigerian life, our afflictions are pretty much the same. The insecurity is general to all. 
even the inequalities, I dare say, are equally general to all. It's just about degrees. It's a function of how much you can equalize or not equalize the all-pervading insanity that is all over our society. So you can find almost near unanimity when you ask Nigerians what they think about the situation of their country. There is general dissatisfaction. The only thing that you might not find is an agreement as it relates to where we need to be going. Once you start talking about solutions, you find that issues of religiosity, issues of ethnicity, issues of religiosity, all sort of devices by which Nigeria has been splintered begins to play because we must never agree on what the solutions are. It is not in the interest of the beneficiaries of the mess to ever allow us to agree. And unfortunately, we appear almost incapacitated when it comes to an appreciation of our common interests as a people. So it becomes very easy for us to retreat into different enclaves and then lose the capacity to see the commonalities of our afflictions. When the Yoruba man talks about insecurity, he talks about insecurity through the prism of his marginalization within the security apparatus and agencies. When the Igbo man addresses the same subject, he addresses it from the same viewpoint. And they are valid viewpoints. Because when you look at the lopsided nature of our situation, it then gives room to find validity for these divisions. But even in spite of these divisions that we play up, the general agreement amongst Nigerians is that we are not in a good place and we need to be moving from where we are. But it is critical that in seeking change, we should define the kind of change that we are seeking. The failure to define that change in 2014, 2015 is what led to the disaster that we are all nursing in Asso Rock today. There was a focus on the presidency to the detriment of a review of the system and because of that focus on the presidency, what then happened was that the person of General Buhari was infused with messianic marketing ideas. And by the time the Jagaban marketing franchise and the Americans who worked on his campaign and the several gifted men and women who worked to market General Buhari in 2014, 2015 were done, you would have thought that with his emergence, all of Nigeria's problems would disappear. So instead of defining systemic changes, we settled in I'm saying we because I'm being generous. It was a stupid law. Okay, sorry. It was you geniuses who went ahead and elected a man that your brains should have told you is completely incapable of doing the work. So now he came in. No agenda clearly defined. The change you have is from one level of madness to a different level of madness. So today, don't let me get ahead of myself. Let me deal with the second. You've defined the change. Defining the change is essentially the first step. It's almost like diagnostics. If you've not defined exactly where it is you want to head, it becomes impossible to have a clear understanding of where the person that is promising you change is leading you to. And that was exactly what happened to us. And we are almost back there again. A failure to define the change is what is bringing all form of jokers creeping out of the woodworks. This morning, I was afflicted by the sight of the statue building one. I was that one, my, my people, my people, from Imo, busy declaring presidential ambition. Yes. It is the turn of Indigo if we are still using that stupid thing because we've created it because of our failure to build a country. But we all signed on to this, even those of us who never signed on to it. 
reality is that it's Indigo Stone. Okay, fine. But Indigo Stone, too. and then it has to be a roaches. The system is throwing up the worst that Indigo has to offer because you've made it about personnel instead of looking to the structure and the system. But um, when you understand where Nigeria needs to be, and you see where we are, it becomes easy to understand why our system is structured the way it is structured. I would explain myself. There was a viral video on TikTok a few months ago. I believe it was um, either a Kenyan lady, she was somewhere in the Scandinavian country. She was holding up an iPhone and she was talking about how she, an African, has to pay for her phone. But the Scandinavian, just as a type, does not need to do that. It reminded me of a book I read by Hernan de Soto. He's an economist, I believe he's from one of the Latin American countries. And he propounded a theory and he called it the theory of debt capital. And his, his argument is that those of us in the so-called third world, we're actually not as poor as the world order has led us to believe because we have no access to credit. Everything we buy, we buy with our cash. But there is a logical conclusion that Hernan de Soto did not draw that the lady in that video alluded to, but that I can try and help us put together because it relates to our own problem. The world is structured on the presumption of African slavery. I know that sounds controversial, but allow me to learn, please. If I work in Africa and I have no access to credit, but the rulers of Africa are constantly taking the wealth of Africa into a country where they cannot even earn good interest or return. They get almost zero interest on the deposit of African wealth, making it easy for the citizens of those countries to which they have exported our wealth to use the wealth of Africa that is stored up in their own country for their own convenience. So I am in Africa, I'm an entrepreneur, but I cannot borrow. In Nigeria, I can borrow for less than 22% from any Nigerian commercial bank. And I'm supposed to be an employer of labor. I'll show you how that tallies. If you create wealth in Africa, and Africans are not constantly having to fought, go into slavery, crossing the Mediterranean, or living through the legalized brain drain, all these IELTS, Canadian today, Britain tomorrow, uh, everywhere in the world Nigerians are running or to stay in their own country because the system in Nigeria makes it impossible for the Nigerian to thrive in his own country. It is not by accident. The West knows what is going on in our country. They benefit from our stupidity and they have nothing to gain by helping us to get out of the mess in which we have immersed ourselves. The place of Nigeria in African liberation cannot be overemphasized. There is a lot, if Nigeria gets it right, if Nigeria were to be working, if things were working normally in Nigeria, if the African I'll, let me share an, a, a true story. I have a friend in the Gambia, Omar Jawara. We went to law school together. So I went to see Omar in Gambia a few years ago, maybe like 12 years or thereabout. And I met a Sierra Leonean also in the Gambia. And this guy told me, he said when we were young, if they will say that there was a popular saying in Freetown, in Sierra Leone, that if you can't go to London, go to Lagos. That was Nigeria in the 80s. You can't say the same for the Nigeria of today that Nigerians themselves are running away from because everything has become degraded. Yes, you can say that if you are in other African countries that are not growing or that are not advancing, and there are very few of those, 
I've said it a few times that I am ashamed to travel in West Africa these days because of the sense of guilt I feel when they look at me like, so you guys are the ones responsible for the way we are. Because if Nigeria gets its act together, practically every other people will get their own act together. We are the trigger box of Africa, but we've remained what? You have population of entire countries in Europe as children out of school in Nigeria. We've dehumanized life to the point where, and anyway, let me stay on script. The key thing is this. If Nigeria gets it right, Africa gets it right. But how would Nigeria get it right if everybody that we look to for help profits from our situation remaining as it is? And we ourselves are failing woefully to tell ourselves the salient truth about where we are. Personnel changes will not save Nigeria. Let's look at the persons who have come out to propose that they want to run for the presidency. And it is important you also understand, this focus on the presidency is evidence of the lopsided nature of our governance structures. You have so many people in the House of Reps so many people in the Senate, everybody is focusing on the presidency. Because the powers in the presidency of Nigeria, just like Governor, um, sorry, Super Minister Aitofel Fashola said the other day, where the American president is still struggling to have his infrastructure bill passed, Gwari more or less has a rubber stamp legislature who does exactly as it is told. Whether it's PDP, Pupupu, BBB, PRP, APC, it doesn't matter, they're in the house. It's a common spread. We are the victims. They work together, they manage, they will find a way to get it done. But they can't get, it's beyond their can to resolve the problems with which we live. One of the key reasons why I have elected to travel this path is because I realized that if I took everything at once, it might become tedious, but it is also important that certain threads are connected before we get to the climax of our discourse. And one of those is that one, Nobody is going to come and save us. The Americans have no interest in saving us. The British are blessed by our idiocies. The Chinese, they're looking at a new colony. So if anyone has any illusion about some knight in shining armor, some country from the Western Hemisphere intervening in our affairs to bring sanity to our space, you're wasting your time. It's not going to happen. We are the ones who would have to think our way out of this mess. So one of the things I'm trying to do with today's segment is to let you understand, first of all, that you are not going to have anyone riding in to save us. We are the ones who are going to have to save ourselves. Get that clear. Everybody has profit from what we're doing wrong. That's one. Second thing is that I need us to also understand that this is not going to be about personnel changes. Personnel changes will not save Nigeria. You can change the personnel as many times as you care if you do not touch the governance systems. And yes, I know, all of you are wondering, how do you do anything about the governance system? You're talking about changing the constitution only a few months to election. Some of you are also telling us to go and register to vote. Don't worry, hold your horses. We'll get to that point as well. Even I will still tell you to go and register to vote. I assure you, I will still tell you to go and register to vote. We will get there. It's the first battle. Today is the second part. Still have two more parts. But remember, today you have to understand the charter of slavery by which we are currently ruled is the 1999 Constitution. I have done my best to offer you contest 
for how we got to where we are. Because it's the last subhead in my list of subjects to touch on today, I'm going to spend a little time seeking to give you a clear understanding of the centrality of the 1999 Constitution to the issues. The constitution of every country in the world is not unlike the rules and regulation of your resident association, for instance, or your motto club, motto bike riders association. So you wrote a rule setting out how you want to organize your affairs. That's the same thing with any constitution anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, the problem with Nigeria is that the last time we wrote a constitution for ourselves was in 1963. That constitution that was written in 1963 ran into a roadblock in 1966. Every constitution that has been written for Nigeria since that time till date has been written without the imprimatur of the Nigerian people. It has always been by the will of men carrying guns, enforcing the will of an hegemony. I have spoken at length about this hegemony in my book, The Imperatives of the Nigerian Revolution. And I am committing to making that book available for free from Monday. I'm actually going to release it for all of you to start reading. Hopefully, you develop the will to start reading. But I'll try my best to give you the background as I have promised. Between 1953 and 1960, an agreement was reached by the founding fathers of Nigeria that Nigeria would be a federal state. Before 1953, Nigeria was being run essentially as a unitary system. And the last constitution, I believe that would have been the Robert, I think it was the McPherson constitution, yeah. Obafemi Awolo kicked against it, refused to send ministers. That constitution collapsed because of the insistence of Obafemi Awolo that Nigeria would have to be structured as a federation so that no part is able to dictate to the other and there is no centrality of power but the devolution of powers. The 1953 constitution in Lancaster, the Lancaster House Conference of 1953, brought to the table the concept of federalism for every part of Nigeria and it was accepted. Amadou Belu was poised to champion a breakdown so that Northern Nigeria would go. Accepted, he was persuaded by the arguments of Awolowo, and so was Azikwe and the minorities who went to the conference with Aulo, they were persuaded that Nigerians were better served by the adoption of federalism. They were further persuaded that Nigeria was even better served by the adoption of a parliamentary system of governance. Let us understand clearly that these agreements were being continually refined between 1953 and 1960. The culmination of those agreements at independence was the Independence Constitution of 1960. That constitution lasted all of three years. Let me say two, because the process for its amendment was kicked off by 1962. And by 1963, you had the, independ you had the, uh, the Republican Constitution of 1963. It gave Nigeria its structures, four regions parliamentary system, independent candidacy, multiplicity of parties. You could even run as an independent. Everything Nigerians are crying for today, every demand from every part of Nigeria related to the constitution of Nigeria and its restructuring has been answered by the 1963 constitution. The continuing refuser to go back to the original agreement that set up Nigeria, the people who negotiated the existence of Nigeria were not stupid. Nobody wanted to be subjugated by any other. 
and they crafted a document that took them all of 13, all of 10 years to put together and that was placed in the dustbin just by illiterate soldiers Illiterate, the likes of obasanjo the likes of babangida ebuari those are the men and abacha a common thief common thieves those were the men because look let's understand i believe it's in abakuk for those of you christians who are practicing christians i think it's somewhere around abakuk 2 verse 1 it says the vision is for an appointed time though it tarries wait for it then it talks about writing it down so that those who read it might run with it think about it the constitution of a country encapsulates the visions of its founders what were the visions guiding the design of nigeria in the mind of an abacha in the mind of a babangida in the mind of an obasanjo what vision if you look around nigeria today it is clear to see the fruit of the vision by which nigeria was designed look around you to see the kind of people aspiring to public office in nigeria today tells you all you need to know about the vision that designed nigeria that vision is what is encapsulated in the 1999 constitution you sit down and you expect the beneficiaries of a robbery to amend the constitution <laughs> i refuse to get ahead of myself where we need to go from here is the place where nigeria allows nigerians the capacity to grow we need to go to a place where hope is no longer vaporized we need to go to a place where we are the citadel of our race a place that africans or black people all over the world can come to and seek refuge not a place where people flee constantly not a place where the very best of our children of our future look the greatest dream of the nigerian youth today is to get out of nigeria surely surely this cannot be the fate that god designed for a country this blessed surely if you have any doubt as to what i'm talking about let me remind those of you who come from villages outside of Lagos, especially in the western part of Nigeria, if you're a Yoruba person. If you went back to your village in recent times, you'll find a common phenomenon. People only go back to those villages to bury their old. The young rarely stay there. Everybody runs away from there. And you're not just running away from the auntie you've labeled a witch. People are labeled, running away because opportunities do not exist there. But the villages have become microcosm of the Nigerian state itself. Sheung, God bless his soul, we call it escape. Everybody is escaping. But some of us are committed to stay in here. But we refuse to stay here as victims. The next lecture which will come up, I believe that will be on don't let me go and mouth off and bring the wrong date again. Today is Tuesday, so it must be Thursday. It's coming up on Thursday, which is the third part. And that is the one I believe that is most critical. What I have done with the first one and this one is to lay the background for what I believe should be one of the most critical portion of this series. And that's where I'll be talking about what does 2023 electoral cycle have to offer. Let me put it this way. There are only two games if you're trying to change society. You're either going to pick up guns or you're going to pick up ballots. I think I rather like the idea of picking up ballots. And I rather like the fact that none of you can claim that they're asking you to do more than you should be interested in doing. See you on Thursday. Don't worry. 
I know you have a thousand and one questions. Put them together. I'll give a minimum of two hours on Sunday when we have the question and answer session. And it will be necessary given the, what is going to follow on Thursday and I believe on Saturday. But please, do make it a date on Thursday. We will then talk about what does 2023 electoral cycle have to offer. I believe that we should change the game. I'll talk about changing that game on Thursday. Thank you for joining me. And thanks for your patience with my rambling. God bless you. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.